I'm Clive Cookson, science editor at the Financial Times. Beautiful view over the Thames, socially distanced chat with David O'Reilly, who's the company's director of scientific research. David, we're here to talk about something that people might feel is a bit incongruous. A tobacco company carrying out a leading COVID-19 vaccine project. Tell us how that came about. Well, I can understand, Clive, why people uh, might think that. Um, but in reality, for many, many years, uh, we've been looking for alternative uses of tobacco. And about 10 years ago, we started working with a biotech company in Kentucky called Kentucky Bioprocessing, or KBP. And then a few years later, we bought them. In 2014, they produced a treatment for Ebola, working with a ph pharmaceutical company called uh, ZMAP Pharmaceuticals. And that was, that was given emergency use authorization by the US FDA and used by American healthcare workers during Ebola. And then we turned our attention to could we build a biologics business using tobacco as a source, of, like a factory, if you like, for biologics. And for the last four or five years, we've been working on a seasonal flu uh, vaccine with the help of the FDA. And they were very keen to work with us because the tobacco system has many advantages, we think, over conventional systems. But in this case, the speed of production is incredible. It takes about six weeks from start to finish to create a batch of quadrivalent influenza virus using our system and one week's growth in the plants themselves. So that would allow a health agency like the CDC or the FDA predict the strains that are going to come to their uh, region in September rather than the previous March, which of course will increase accuracy. So that still is underway, and in fact, last month we've gone into clinic in our phase one trials for our QIV candidate. But of course, the real story here is in January, like a lot of other vaccine developers, uh, we saw the sequence for SARS-CoV-2, and we immediately set to work on a COVID-19 candidate, and that's where we are today. We last talked about it on the 1st of April when um, you announced the project, and we wrote about it in the Financial Times. Um, you were saying then, fingers crossed, I think, that you hoped by June you might be in a position to make one to three million yeah. doses of the vaccine. How has it gone over the last few months? So there are two sides to that. The, the one to three million doses per month were well on target and, and are producing at that rate, and we hope to ramp up our manufacturing capability further. And we're talking to partners to help uh, with that around the world. On the uh, development and testing side, we've had a very successful preclinical uh, testing period. In July, we submitted uh, an investigational new drug application, an IND, uh, to the US FDA. And we're in discussion with the FDA about entering clinical trials. In the last two or three weeks, we've taken scientific advice, not just from the FDA, but from a number of other scientific and regulatory bodies working on uh, vaccines. And they've gave, gave us some interesting insights based on some of the vanguard candidates that are going through testing. And as such, we've decided to refine our approach to our clinical testing. So we're taking some time now to look at our clinical protocol. And when we're ready and when we agree with the FDA, we will, we will enter our phase one clinical trials. And we hope that will be as soon as possible. Is there a problem in that there are so many candidate COVID-19 vaccines, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in development, that there's a shortage of capacity and a shortage of um, clinical trial participants around the world, particularly at a time when, God willing, the um, pandemic is ebbing, at least in some places. Is, is that a constraint? It's not a constraint for us, um, and we're running our quadrivalent influenza virus trials on, on multiple sites in the US right now. So we didn't have a problem with that. We've got sites booked for our COVID uh, vaccine. I understand the general uh, concern um, that with 140 candidates now on the WHO list, and, and I believe there are many more that aren't on that list, or at least not mm. yet on that list, and there are about 28, 29 in, in clinical testing. It could become a concern, but I think really, Clive, the world needs every shot on goal it can get. You know, we hope that other candidates are successful, and certainly we're not going to be the first with our uh, candidate, but we hope it will be successful, and when it's ready, we're certain that there will be a need for it in, in many countries around the world. 
let's talk a little more about it. Have, have you <coughs> published any of the preclinical work or the inves investigational work in, in, in the journal? Yes. Or is that still waiting to come out? So we, we are um, writing three papers currently on the preclinical work, which we hope to publish soon. As I said, the preclinical uh, work has gone well. We're seeing a good uh, immune response in the uh, preclinical tests, and, and we anticipate a good safety profile. And obviously we're now refining our uh, designs based on that and based on the scientific advice that we're getting uh, from uh, regulators around the world. Is this comparable to the um, protein subunit vaccines that are made in other ways. How, how would you put it in the spectrum? It's obviously not an adenovirus no. vaccine. It's not an mRNA or a DNA vaccine. It's not an inactivated whole virus. How, how would you put it in the spectrum, given that it's I made in plants? Yeah, I, I, I think it's unique. And, um, you know, I think it's really interest, interesting in the race uh, to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic that there are so many different platforms currently being tested for SARS-CoV-2. Um, our platform is new to world. It's, it's only just gone in uh, first in humans with our QIV candidate. Um, but we think it's very different. It has some unique properties. Uh, the TMV scaffold, which is the effectively uh, the viral-like scaffold on is which... that tobacco mosaic Tobacco virus. mosaic virus, in inactivated tobacco mosaic virus, on which we conjugate the uh, SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain antigen. That in itself elicits uh, both a humoral and cellular immune response in humans. Um, so it, it acts almost like an adjuvant, and, and we will also add uh, other adjuvants. Um, so we think this is, um, it is unique, and it has utility well beyond uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. The benefits of the system, we think, is in, in plant-grown uh, biologics, but vaccines in particular, the rate of production is incredibly rapid. The plant is very good at manufacturing um, millions and billions of copies of the of the, uh, the, the candidate vaccine. Um, it, the plant also replicates uh, your construct incredibly uh, precisely. It's got incredibly high fidelity, which is good, because that's a worry that in other systems, are you making what you've programmed it to make? Um, it's good from a safety point of view, because uh, the tobacco plant can't host known human pathogens. So that's one less thing uh, to worry about. And I think finally, the, the fact that our um, platform seems to be room temperature stable for six to 12 months, I think will have great utility, particularly in those countries where refrigerated supply chains are not available. And as such, we have been talking to governments in developing countries where that is a problem for them. That could be the biggest advantage of it all, could be. I think, if this appears as, let's call it a second generation yes. COVID vaccine. So without wishing to offer hostages to fortune, when, when do you think you might conclude your discussions with regulators and others and go into clinical trials with this? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say, but we would hope within the next month or so that we'd have concluded those uh, discussions and, uh, and got clearance from the FDA with a revised uh, protocol. Um, to then go into clinical testing. And, and we're very pleased that we've had this scientific advice. You know, nobody wants to, you know, we, we, I guess we hope to go into clinic sooner, but actually not being one of the first has given us the advantage of getting the benefit of the emerging scientific knowledge on COVID. And, and as you know, the knowledge is exponential month by month. And so we're pleased to get this advice. We're pleased to be able to use it to give our candidate the best chance of success. Um, when it will be ready overall, that's, that's very difficult to say at this stage. It's early days. We'd like to see our, our phase one safety results and then get into phase two and three on demonstrating not just safety, but obviously efficacy. So uh, it, it, this is a marathon, I think, not a sprint. And whilst we won't be one of the first, we hope to offer the world a, you know, a safe and efficacious candidate that could be used for the long term. Given that Kentucky, bi Kentucky Bioprocessing is a US-based subsidiary, does that mean that the initial work will be done mainly in the US? Yes, in it, all, all of the actual practical work is being done in the US, including the first uh, the clinical studies, phase one, possibly phase two. We have talked to regulators elsewhere about phase three studies, as well as, as taking scientific advice. We're also talking to governments around the world about expanding our manufacturing 
uh, capacity, both in the US and potentially in other countries, particularly those countries that have um, a history of plant-based um, agronomy and biotech. Um, so it's early days, but what, you know, we have this, te this technology, we have this platform which we think uh, can be interesting to the world, which has some unique advantages. And we're doing it on a not-for-profit basis, as we publicly stated. Um, so we're very open for partners that can bring something to the party for us, to work with us, and governments who are interested in our, our technology. Is there any prejudice amongst the medical community in working with a tobacco company subsidiary on this? Not that, I'm, not that I've seen, Clive, and I, I've been pleasantly surprised with, uh, by that. All of the regulators or scientific institutes or other bodies uh, that we've spoken to, with, with being fully transparent that KPP is owned by BAT, uh, have, have not seemed to have any prejudice at all. And we, we found uh, these agencies to be incredibly positive, to be incredibly helpful. They've given us great advice that we're very grateful for. There's another quite different prejudice, at least in Europe, against genetically modified plants. Now, I know that's for food rather than medical purposes. Could that be an obstacle or not? It shouldn't be, Clive, because um, whilst effectively the tobacco plants are genetically modified with the constructs both for the TMV scaffold and the antigen, um, we then ex purify to pharma grade both of those components. So in effect, the transformed genetically modified tobacco plant doesn't exist in the final product. So I'm hoping that that won't, I mean, there'll be many prejudices, as you know, uh, in, in the whole world of, of vaccines. I don't anticipate that being a specific prejudice for our candidate. Are you aware of any other companies approaching COVID vaccines through plants? Or are you out on your own with this? No, there's another, there's another company uh, called Medicargo. And again, we wish them the, the greatest of success. Uh, they use uh, plant-based uh, vaccine technology. It's different to ours, which is good because that gives the world two uh, different options on this. Uh, so we're, we're the two main players uh, in this area. And I think what we would hope, certainly what we as, as KVP and BAT would hope, is you know, plant-based biologics is, is not very well known or understood. It's not well used. That perhaps if we or, or Medicargo or others are successful in, in this, it may open the, the eyes of the world and the scientific community in particular to look at plant-based biologics and the potential benefits that they bring uh, to the world of, of medical research and treatment and prevention. Are tobacco plants particularly well suited to um, biologics and sort of medical purposes? Or is it just that you know them so well because um, you are a tobacco company and you have scientists who've been studying tobacco for decades? I, I think, if, you know, fortuitously, we, we do understand the tobacco plant very well, as does the scientific community. It is the model plant, if you like. Mm. Um, but beyond that, tobacco is a very good uh, factory or vehicle for producing biologics. Uh, the entire genetic sequence is known of multiple varieties, it grows very rapidly, it has tremendously complex machinery inside it. So if we go back to the ZMAP example, that was a tripartite monoclonal antibody, and the tobacco plant was very faithful and very precise in assembling a complex biological molecule that was then used in humans. Are the tobacco plants that are used for this purpose, would they to the lay um, person look just like the tobacco plants growing in fields to be turned into leaf tobacco or indeed the ornamental tobaccos that people grow yeah. in their gardens. I suppose they, do they look the same? I suppose it depends how expert the viewer is. Um, <laughs> if you've got a history in, in, in botany and plant virology, I would say they look very different. Um, the, the, the variety that we use for, um, for biologic production and, and vaccine production is a relative of Nicotiana tobaccum which is the, the species that is used in, in commercial tobacco growing or nicotinic uh, production. So it's a related species. It comes from Australasia, um, but it's very similar to Nicotiana tobacco, uh, but it grows rapidly. It can be transfected uh, very easily. It can be handled very easily. We, it's all grown indoors in, uh, in very highly controlled uh, environment and uh, is, is very good for the production of um, biologics, as I said. Let's talk about the 
other vaccines that you're developing on this platform. First of all, the Ebola one. Is that still being used given that there are sporadic Ebola outbreaks in Africa? Or is that sort of dormant at the moment? No, it's dormant and it wasn't a vaccine. It was a, it was a monoclonal antibody oh, yes. treatment. Yes. So um, at the time in 2014, that was the only treatment available to the world. So that's why the FDA gave KBP emergency use authorization. And obviously time moves on. And as time moved on, uh, there were other treatments, better treatments, as you'd expect with innovation and the progression of science and technology, and ultimately a vaccine. So in 2015, I think it was, we stopped the production of uh, ZMAP in our tobacco-based system. That raises another question. People are developing monoclonal antibodies and antibody treatments for COVID-19. Presumably that's occurred to you. Yes, it, it has occurred, and we've looked at that. Um, and, you know, we're looking at multiple uses of tobacco in our research, including monoclonal antibodies and, and treatments and, and other um, you know, therapeutic proteins that you could grow in tobacco. Um, but right now, we're focusing on the vaccine. The current scale of our manufacturing suits a vaccine more than a monoclonal antibody, because you're talking microgram doses rather than milligram or, or gram-based doses. But that's not to rule it out in the future. You know, one of our ambitions long term, you know, we have this ambition in the company called A Better Tomorrow, which is to reduce the public health impact of our business. Plant-based biologics could become part of that future. And the work we're doing now in KBP could represent a future use of tobacco uh, that isn't about tobacco products like cigarettes or, or other products that people consume. The flu vaccine, you've said that's just going into phase one clinical trials. How, tell us about that and how that um, compares with other sort of candidate flu vaccines. So it, it uses um, similar antigens. As you know, there are multiple strains of seasonal flu in circulation, and most vaccines are called quad quadrivalent uh, vaccines, so they have four strains. And what that means, obviously, is that the public health authorities have to predict in enough time which strains are going to come to their country. Uh, the benefit of our system is because of the rapid production public health authorities can choose the strains nearer to flu season, which increases accuracy. Um, but then you add on top of that the uh, benefit, we think, of the TAP platform, which is the tobacco mosaic virus scaffold. Um, again, in clinical testing, we've had good immune response. Uh, we've had good toxicity and safety data. But we're, and we're really anxious, of course, to see the results of our phase one uh, clinical study, because this is the first in humans of our TAP platform. You know, if we're successful, then we think this could revolutionise how public health authorities deal with seasonal flu because of accuracy um, in predictions and the rate of manufacturing. And of course, um, the other benefits such as uh, room temperature stability. That's going to be a longer journey, I think. Um, and of course, we're very acutely aware as we do clinical studies on QIV, we don't want to compete with resources that are being used for COVID. So we're debating at the moment, do we do our phase two this winter, or would it be better to defer it, given that if there's a COVID outbreak, we don't want to utilize resources that are better used um, for treatments and vaccines and other therapies for COVID-19. Great, well, we wish you luck. And on that optimistic note, um, we're gonna time travel from London at the end of August to Trieste live on the 3rd of September. Thank you very much, David. Thank Look you for the discussion. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion.